Hey guys, this is Jacoli of Jacoya Gems. Thank you for once again coming back home, family. For those of you that happen to be new here, welcome. I definitely hope that you hear something today that will persuade you to stay. If you have not already done so, exactly what are you waiting for? Go ahead and do me as well as yourself a favor and hit the subscribe button. Like the video, comment down below, and share it to your social media platforms. So, I did a video previously on the historicity of Abram in 2nd millennial BC, aligning him by definition, location, custom, immigration patterns, linguistics, description, all of that to the high bureau. Um, timeline and everything. Um, I had them correlated side by side to the Hyksos, the Shashu of Yahweh, um, as well as Sennacherib. The third and um, the relationship between Abram being a warlord and him being the Arabic sheikh and going down into West Africa as well as the Sudan, Chad, Libya, so on as the Sahel um, with that Pharaoh. And then we saw that mapped out in Genesis 14. Y'all, I dropped a lot of history in that video. So I'm going to just comment it down below um, so that. When I'm reading this blog, it'll come more full circle. But I'm about to read one of my blogs so that we can get the hysteresis, some more hysteresis, but specifically concerning some of the women in the book of Genesis, as well as the meanings of creation. So the title of the blog is No Bastards in the House. So um I want to and then I I made a video super 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 long on the biblical definition explanation of what a bastard is. So I'm gonna leave that down below so I don't make that too long because it's very in depth. It's very in depth. I will tell you what it is not it is not a child born out of wedlock because when I read this, we're going to see what wedlock is. And I'm not even going to go fully into all the different types of marriages in the Bible and the different examples. Um, so when we look at bastard, the word is mamzer. It's going to be um, mem, mem, um, sedek, resh. It literally means illegitimate birth, meaning child of incest. It also means a mongoat race. So when we begin to look at Deuteronomy 23 and 3, let's precept this. Um, an Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yohei even to their 10th generation, shall they not enter into the congregation of Yohei forever because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt and because they hired against the Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethro of Mesopotamia to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee, and thou shalt seek their peace, nor thy prosperity all thy days long. So that was the explanation, right? Via scripture. So we are also going to get into who the Ammonites are and the Moabites are, since it said, so we are going to go into scripture to see who the Ammonites and Moabites are and see if they are children of incest or if that definition, um, you know, suffices. So a lot of y'all know this information already. I do not want to treat people as if they already know. So let's go to Genesis 19 and 37. Okay. And it reads as such. Oh, I'm going to read up, y'all. I'm going to read up because that's not gone. Okay, so this is about Lot. We have to remember that Lot is Abraham's nephew. And so his father died. 
when they were leaving out of Mesopotamia. So just with some historicity, we can have proof because it talks about there being a famine in the time of Abram. Y'all know I'm a... Just have to line some things up. Just just a little. So that um we can make it historical because that's why y'all here. Y'all here because I'm a geek. I already know. And I appreciate it. <laughs> I really do. I appreciate it. Like I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of the support and the appreciation for the level of um Knowledge that the Most High has been able to decipher with me. Um, famine. Let me see. I'm going to just type this in. Y'all, I can use my notes on my phone like Google. That's crazy. That's really crazy. And so there was a worldwide famine between 2200 to 2100 BC. 2180 in Egypt. Genesis 12 and 10 says, and there was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land. I'm going to pull up an article on newscientist.com how Egypt was fled by famine in 1280 BC. Even ancient Egypt, mighty pyramid builders were powerless in the face of the famine that helped bring down their civilization around 2180 BC. Now, evidence gleaned from the mud deposited by the river now suggests that a shift in climate thousands of kilometers to the south was ultimately to blame. And the same or worse could happen today. The ancient Egyptians depended on the Nile's annual flood to irrigate their crops. But any change in the climate that pushed the African monsoon southwards out of Ethiopia would have been diminished these floods. See, I want y'all to know that, you know, when we think about Ethiopia, we're thinking about today, Ethiopia, Eritrea. A lot of times in the Bible, more times than not, Ethiopia is referring to ancient Sudan. It is very applicable to the Ethiopians. We have to be aware of the fact that the Cushitic people came out of Ham and they first are known to be Sabines. They are Afro-Arabs as well. They are Afro-Asiatic people too. They just happen to be Hermetic. They first populated the Arabian Peninsula and the ancient Sudan. And so Mesopotamia, the Levant, um, during this time, this was the Ubedian period in Mesopotamia and the Nakata 1, Nakata 2, Nakata 3 periods in ancient Egypt. They ran concurrently with one another. It's going to be very important that y'all watch that video that I did before. And I'm going to go through some of my other videos because I have some videos that's mad long with like pottery and everything. Showing you guys the pottery from Mesopotamia. Um... In comparison to the Ubedian cultures, in comparison to the Nakadian cultures, but I took it a step further because Zion Lex did that. Shout out to him. I also compared them to the the pottery that's in Canaan and Israel, West Africa, and to some of the pottery in the Americas that are identical during that time to show the different dispersions of these people group. Dwelling in the rains in the Ethiopian highlands would have meant fewer plants to stabilize the soil. When rain did fall, it would have washed large amounts of soil into the Blue Nile and into Egypt, along with sediment from the White Nile. Blue wild mud has a different isotope signature from that of the White Nile. So by analyzing isotopes, differences in mud deposits in the Nile Delta, Michael Chrome of Leeds University worked out what proportion of the sediment came from each branch of the river. Chrome reasoned that during, Nile, during periods of drought, the amount of Blue Nile mud in the river would be relatively high. He found that one of those periods from 4,500 to 4,200 years ago immediately predates the fall of the Egyptian old empire. The weakened waters would have been catastrophic for the Egyptians. And I quote, changes that affect flood supply don't have to be very large to have a ripple effect in societies, says Bill Ryan of the Lamont Dotary Earth Observatory in New York. Similar events today could be even be more devastating, says team member Daniel Stanley, a geoarchaeologist from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. 
And I quote, anything humans do to shift the climate belts would have an even worse effect along the now systems today because the populations have increased dramatically. Journal Reference Geology, Volume 30, page 71. Let's go back to my notes. Okay. Economics problems, droughts and famine weakened the Old Kingdom. There was a severe drought um, 200 years in North and East Africa around 2200 BC. Hieroglyphics recorded that the annual Nile flood fell for about 50 years and many people died in famine. This may have produced the collapse of the Old Kingdom and the period of chaos that continued. So this source that I'm reading from, I'm about to continue to read, is um, Professor Freak. Fekri Hassan, BBC, February 17, 2011. Professor Fekri Hassan wrote for the BBC, and I quote, What was the factor that weakened monarchy and allowed provincial governors to assume royal power over their regions? This is talking about when the Hyksos, line it up, Holy Spirit, came in and took over ancient Egypt. How did they, how were they able to do that? Remember, the Hyksos are Amorites. These are nomadic, tent-dwelling, as well as semi-sedentary shepherd people groups. And this is why the Hebrews could live autonomously in Goshen in the time of Jacob. Because we shared the same customs with these people as well as the same gods in Mesopotamia. Hence, when you see the Ankh. And the cows and the lions and the six point stars and um, Lapel's Lazul in ancient Egypt and the shepherds quote, these are a sign of Cushitic and Hebraic people groups. The Bible tells us that shepherds are abominations to the Egyptians. And we see that Abraham was first called Hebrew in Egypt. Hi, B rule. Let's continue. One possibility is an invasion by Asiatics. Boom. However, there is no evidence that Asiatics invaded Egypt at the time of the Old Kingdom. Not true. Alternatively, the initial breakdown of the Old Kingdom was caused by a sudden, unanticipated, cash- catastrophic reduction in the now flood over two or three decades. This was so severe that the famine gripped the country and paralyzed the political institutions. People were forced to commit unheard of atrocities, such as eating their own children and violating the sacred sanctity of the royal dead. Let's get some scripture. Deuteronomy 28, 53 through 55. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thine sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and towards the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave so that he will not give to any of them the flesh of his children whom he shall eat because he hath nothing left in him, the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in all thy gates. Another precept, Jeremiah 19, 8 through 9. And I will make this city desolate and a hissing. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And they shall eat every one of the flesh of his friends in the siege and the straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Ezekiel 5 and 10. Therefore the father shall eat their sons in the midst of thee and the sons shall eat their fathers and I will execute judgments in thee and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into the winds. Second Kings 6, 24 and 31. I know it's out of two or three witnesses, so the thing be established, but we're going to line up these precepts since I'm here. And it came to pass after this that Ben Hadad, mind you, Ben Hadad, just like Kassan, are Edomite names. Look into Hadad the Edomite. He fled into Egypt. So um, the king of Syria gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of the cob of doves dung for 
excuse me, five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing up by the wall, there cried a woman unto him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, what eleth thee? And she said, the woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed up and he passed by up on the wall. And the people look and behold, he had sackcloth with upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so and more also to me. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shepheth, shall stand on him this day. So where did they go in famine? Sub-Saharan Africa had plenty in 3000 BC to 2000 BC. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Songhom was domesticated in the Sahel region of Africa by 3000 BC along with the pearl mint by 2000 BC. Yams were domesticated in several distinct locations, including West Africa and cow peas by 2500 BC. While earlier research points to edible plants such as squash beans, lucum, gava, pake, and corn note at Carroll, publications by Haas and Pallis have added um, the avocado, maize, to the list of foods in this region throughout 3000 to 118, I mean to 1800 BC. So rice is from Africa and first seen in China during the Hang Dynasty. And this is the dispersions of the Hamites, the Sinites via Sin going into China. And I'm gonna just give a little more because I'm not gonna stick to this, um, but just giving y'all some historicity. So rice, African rice was also independently de domesticated in West Africa and cultivated by 1000 BC. This is during the time of King David, specifically when David pushed out the Philistines into Mauritania, Mali, come in, Morocco, Chad, to become the Berbers. And likely fennet millet was domesticated in Ethiopia by 3000 BC. And this is during the exact times that we are reading on, um, in these articles along with nong, insect, and coffee. Other plant foods domesticated in Africa included wallamelon, okra, turmeric, and black-eyed peas, along with tree crops such as kola nut and oil palm, plantains, and bananas by 1500 BC. 1500 BC is around the time that we are going to get into, into another one of my videos. That's around the time, 1500 um, 1550 is when you're going to begin to see the Hyksos being expelled out of Egypt. The hamlet Gunafal was domesticated in West Africa. Sangha cattle was likely also domesticated in Northeast Africa around 7,000 BC and later crossbred with other species. 3,000 BC, the Americas had food. In South America, agriculture began as early as 9000 BC, starting with the cultivation of several species of plants that later only became minor plants. In the Andes of South America, the potato was domesticated 8000 BC and 5000 BC, along with beans, squash, tomatoes, peanuts, coca, llamas, apacas, and guena, uh, guinea pigs. Cassava was domesticated in the Amazon basin no later than 7000 BC. Maize found its way to South America from Mesoamerica, where wild tinsonet was domesticated around 7000 BC. Um, selective bread maize. Cotton was domesticated in Peru by 4, 4200 BC. Other species of cotton was domesticated in Mesoamerica and became by far the most important species of cotton in the textile industry in modern times. Evidence um, of agriculture in the eastern United States dates about 3000 BC. This is where the Hebrews and stuff, even though the P Peruvians, those are Hebrews. Too. We're not going to get into that. But when I'm talking about them leaving, a lot of times they were coming straight into the United States. Other times they were going into the islands. But you see how this lines up out of 3000 BC. Um, 
The same foods, maize, squash, and beans that were seen in Africa in 3000 BC are also seen in the Americas. The Bronze Age 3300 BC witnessed the intensification of agriculture and civilizations such as Mesopotamia, Suma, ancient Egypt, ancient Sudan, and the Indus civilization of the Indian subcontinent, ancient China, and ancient Greece. So I'm going to leave that be and get into my blog. I should just read it from my phone, so I don't have to read it from the website because it's in cursive. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. So, you already read Deuteronomy 23 and 2. So, Sumer means plain, P-L-A-I-N. It's the setting of Genesis. The Arabian Gulf, the Sahel, Iraq, Iran, the Sudan, Indus Valley, Turkey, Kuwait is the location of the Garden of Eden. The Arabian Gulf was originally inhabited by Cushitic Sabines. Ethiopia is rendered Cush in Hebrew and oftentimes refers to the southern Sudan. Although Hermetic Cushitics are considered Afro-Arab due to their origins in south and southern um, Arabia. Nimrod, the son of Cush, founded Akkad, Shinar, Iraq, Babylon, and Kala. The Sahel also means plain. And is Chad, Niger, Senegal, Mali, Gambia, Mauritania, and Burkina Faso. This is sub-Saharan Africa. And in 2nd millennium BC, Abram went into Egypt due to famine. I talked about that already, so I'm not going to do that again. So Havila and the Table of Nations falls under Ham and Shem. Cousins bearing the same names was not foreign. This also speaks to the fact that Havila was in the Sudan, Horn of Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. Sudan means land of blacks. Ethiopia was Ethiopia, according to Herodotus. He described Africa as African Ethiopia and the Indus Valley as Asiatic Ethiopia. Herodotus determined Ethiopia meant burnt face, red, brown. Ruddy is the description of the Nazareth's David and Solomon, red, brown. Ruddy, um, the purest branch of Arab progenitor is Jotan, whom inhabited the Arabian and Yucatan Peninsula in Peru. See, this is what I was getting into with the Peruvians having food and things in 6000 BC. So check this. Boats in 6000 BC were seen in the Ubedian culture of the Levant in ancient Egypt were found. Akkadian and Maya languages are mutually intelligible. Assyrian pyramids and artifacts are found in Peru during the Nakata periods of Egypt, concluding ancient Egyptians were not in Egypt. Adome or Alf Dilet Mem. Um, this is the vowel marker. Nun Yod is ruddy and the root is Adom. Alf Dilet mem, meaning person, and dom, which is the root of that, means blood. Copper and red are adjectives for Native Americans, red bones of Louisiana, Creoles, Arabs, and Negroes in the diaspora. Hermetic and Hebraic people are often conflated in history. So you can read Genesis 10, 21 through 29. So, there was in Egypt um, a pharaoh by the name of Sunetrib the first that you guys can definitely um, look into. So, most historians place Sunetrib reign in between 1956 to 1911 BC or 1971 to 28 BC. It is accepted that he ruled for 44 years and is co-regent with his father 30 years as sole ruler um, and co-regent with his son. Let me go back to the article. So for the scriptures on 
the Garden of Eden, description, Genesis 2, 10 through 11, 13 through 14. So since I'm about to be reading through these definitions, I suggest that y'all highly get pens and paper. It's going to be Mahor, M-O-H-A-R. This means bright price or dory. This word, virgin, Betsula, B-E-T-U-L-A-H, is Assyrian. It comes from the Assyrian root, bat ulti, B-A-T-U-L-T-U. This also applies to young men. So the word merosha, M-E-O-R-A-S-A-H, means betrothed, engaged, legally married before living with one another. I also want you guys to know that this can mean that they are already cohabitating before they have um, a public wedding ceremony, but they are considerably legally married. So Genesis 24 and 14 uses damo to mean at the age of marriage, because I also want you guys to know that virgin, the word Alma, that's my grandmother's name. It literally means young woman, young woman of marrying age. It does not always have to mean without sex. And we're going to get some graphs on this. As I said, I'm not going into all of the definitions of virgin and all of the examples, so on and so forth. Genesis 24 and 14. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camel's drink also. Let the same be, um, I'm sorry, Genesis, Twenty four and sixteen, yeah, not twenty four and fourteen. So let me pull it up. Okay, and the damsel was very fair to look up on a virgin. Neither had men known her. They had to add that in there because a virgin does not always mean that she had not known man. So. The same usage is found in Deuteronomy 34 and 3 through 4. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spoke kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spoke unto his father, Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. Genesis 24 and 16 refers to Rachel as a damsel as well. Strong 55 and 91, girl, young woman, child, damsel's um, servant. From the age of infancy to adolescence. In Exodus 22, 16 through 17. And it reads. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her. He surely shall endow her to be his wife. So you couldn't just be going around having sex with single women. You had to marry them. You couldn't hoard the, um, humble the daughters of Zion. Let's continue. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him. He shall pay money according to the dowry of the virgins. He had to pay the father. Clearly, the dowry of the virgin, no bride price because the father did not allow the oath to be made. There was no capital punishment for her having sex. There was no capital punishment for him having sex. There was no offering to be sacrificed. What would need to be done that if a man and a woman has sex, let's see. Um, laws. Leviticus 15 and 18. Sixteen. We're going to read up. And if any man's seed of compilation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the eve. And every garment and every skin upon is the seed of compilation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the morning even. The woman also with whom man, lie, man shall lie with seed of compilation, they both shall they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. So take a bath, strip your bed, strip your clothes, you unclean for the rest of the night. 
There was no death penalty for this man lying with a virgin. He had to take her to be a wife. Um, and if the father approved, then the bride price would be paid. The father did not approve, therefore, just the dowry of the virgin. Uh, Genesis 34 and 12. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. She was a virgin and required a gift as well. Genesis 19 and 24. This is when maiden is Batola, meaning living in her father's house. Let's read for context. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now and humble ye them and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vow a thing. This is in the time of the Benjaminites when they were born after Anus. Um, and phallic worship, they adopted the Canaanites customs. And we see them in the time of the Hasmonean dynasty when the Benjaminites actually sided with them. Handed over the priesthood. Tamar was living in her father's house and was raped by Ammon. She was a virgin. They wore distinct garments. She asked him to request her hand first so he would not be humbled by losing her virginity first. Y'all, I just forgot something. And my apologies. Um, Definitely just forgot. Um, I'm going to read down. Okay, so give me a second, you guys. So I'm going back to the time of a lot to explain um, the names of Ammon and Moab. I definitely forgot to do that. So Genesis nineteen thirty-seven. Um, and I said I was gonna read up. So yeah, um Lot is Abraham's nephew and they were leaving from Mesopotamia during that time they split up because Abraham was rich. He had a whole bunch of infrastructure. He had sheep, he had cattle, he had silver, he had gold, he had souls, meaning he had slaves. Like, he, he was that guy, so, of course, he taught his nephew how to become that guy, too. They had too much sustenance, and they began striving. Their their peoples and animals began striving in the land. Okay. Um, so, this is when they were fleeing out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 30, Genesis 19 and 30. And Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain. His two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor and dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on the earth to come in unto us after the matter of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink and wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass the morrow that when the first said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lay with him, that we may preserve seed of our father, that me that may their father drink their wine the night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both of the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, and called his name Moab. The same is the father. That's what the name means of the Moabites until this day. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon until this day. So, yeah. I'm not going to read this whole thing with um, Tamar. Y'all can read it. 
2 Samuel 13, 1 through 6, and 11 through 14. Second Samuel 13, 16 through 19. So Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 29. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and may force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. But unto the damsel there shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as a man, when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is the matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. She's married. She belongs to someone else. Adultery is a capital punishment. And so is rape. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay with her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the father's damsel fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. That's the example that we saw. Um. So, yeah, let's read. The goddess worship in Egypt and the Sinan Peninsula since the fourth millennium B.C. was Hathor. This is the Nicotian periods of Egypt as forementioned. The netters seen in these periods were depicted with the Ankh and Shepherd's Staff. The Ankh is Sumerian um, in representation of An, Anu, and Anum. He is the Sumerian father god of the sky and called On as seen as Egypt. Ki is his consort, K-I, which will end up being K-H. Um, and K-H is also for Kemet as well. The threshing hole floor. Mother Earth and Creator God with Enki in the Garden of Eden. In some stories, she is his big sisters. Binding them together, the Ankh, which is the key of life. Shepherds are abominable to Egyptians due to their affiliations with Hyksos and Hyderus when they were ruling Egypt. The Hyksos are Amorites from Mesopotamia who supplanted Egypt. The Hyderus are Hebrews called children of Eber. Um, Hathor is the cow goddess. Prayed to by infertile women, death, sky, love, and beauty. So I want y'all to know it's a fact that Tara, let me, I might as well just get some scriptures on it. I'm tired yet. We here. Joshua 24 and 2. One, and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua made unto the people that said the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Y'all, when you begin to serve these deities and you make altars unto them. If you don't continue to feed them the same areas that you're asking them to bless you and they'll curse you in. Do we not see the curse of infertility <laughs> amongst Abram and Sarai and down their bloodline? So Terah was also thought to be a priest of On and his ancestors um, and his predecessors and his descendants were said to go into japan and i'm not gonna read all that today because i am tired the eye of ra whom is the sun god of creation with the ankh fusing with Anmoon and atum atum was depicted as a man with the ankh originally an egg positioning him as the firstborn of creation the lion snake sun disc and cattle horns are his symbols heliopolis the city of the sun was his cult center Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren upon entering Egypt, the land of Hathor, the land of fertility. Hathor was the daughter of Pharaoh. I mean, Hagar, excuse me, was the daughter of Pharaoh given to Sarah as a handmaiden in Egypt as a repayment for attempting to go into Sarah. Hagar, G-A-R, means alien, sojourner, guest. Her name reveals that she was a stranger in Egypt. Further proving this dynasty to not 
be native to Egypt. Sennacherib, the third mother's name was Kenmats Nefer Hetjet. K H A N Khan is a prefix that derives from Ham, Han. Horites are called Hor in ancient Egyptian transcripts. Nefer means beauty, seen in Egypt amongst women, and also means individual. A sheep's heart and trachea are its symbols. Khan, Egypt, was founded by Sennacherib II and proprietor of his grandson Amun Hat II and III ruled from Egypt to Kush. Nefer refers to the base level of temple floors, threshing hold, key. Hadet is the white crown of Upper Egypt, seen first on Narmer's Palette in the Temple of Horus in 3100 BC. Bat, the cow goddess, is displayed on the palette and absorbed into Hathor. Mud brick homes and pyramids in Egypt m- mirrors 9000 BC in Jericho, 6000 BC in Mesopotamia due to the lack of wood. So mud brick homes and houses was first seen in Jericho and in Mesopotamia before they were seen in Egypt. Genesis 12 and 11, Genesis 16, 1 and 3. Tosef, Yamat, 8 and 8. This is going on. I'm going to have to read this. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. So, and there was a famine in the land. Um, We read that one. So, Genesis 16, 1 and 3. This is important. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaiden, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And, um... Sarah's Abram's wife took Hadar, her maiden, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. When they entered into Egypt for 10 years, she was barren. Let's get this precept from the oral tradition. So Sofa, that molt 8 and 6 states, that a man must first divorce his wife if they are childless after 10 years of normal marital relations, providing context for Sarah's willingness to take a sister wife. In Hebraic culture, the child born to Sarah would be considered, I mean, the child born to Hagar would be considered Sarah's. So why she treat Ishmael so wrong? And Hagar. The disposition of Sarah's heart rendered Hagar with a child in a desert. Today, open relationships and unrighteous polygamy are the norm. Competition among women creates broken family. The usury of Hagar to fulfill the desire for Sarah, keeping her marriage to Abraham together because he could have legally divorced her and she wanted to stand by a man. Statistics of 60% black women and 80% of black men as parents reflects the dynamic of men fathering multiple children. Biblically, financially, morally, and social reputations determined the qualifications for polygamy and marriage. Abram was a man of wealth and order. He hearkened to the voice of his wife while remembering the promises of El Shaddai. In the land, he was able to reclaim his entire family after the mourning period of the matriarch of the Israelites. So after Sarah passed away, he was able to go back and reclaim his son Ishmael. We about to read this out, y'all. We finna line this up. So, some traditions say that Sarah's evil eye and beating Hagar caused a miscarriage, and Ishmael was the second pregnancy. I make no assertions. So I didn't say this. This is what some traditions say. So the white stone on the upper kingdom, Hajat, originated in Nubia. So the white stone that's on the um, that white hat seen in ancient Egypt during this time originated in Nubia, the lower Nile. An incense burning in a cemetery was discovered in Mesopotamia and Nubia with the same materials. 4000 BC, the Nobatia in Nabatia, that sound like Nabatine, right? When I was talking, okay. Um, in a Cairn region of Kush originated from the Libyan desert. The ancient Libyans descend from Put as the original branch of Moors. Al-Maris is the Arabic name. 
An inscription from the Persian king Darius calls Arabs Hagar. Close the door, I'm cold. The Ad via Almod. So, um, A D. And then Almodad is A L M O D A. Are the original Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula? And I'm going to bring precept for that. Pre Islam. Almodad is the grandson of Eber, son of Jokatan, is the progenitor. Selah, father of Egypt, was a prophet sent to Hagar, H E G R A. Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia, Hagar was named after Hagar. And they are saying that Selah. And we're going to get a precept for who he is. It's related to Eber. They say that he was sent as a prophet to Hagar, Saudi Arabia, to teach the message of the poor. Y'all, the word poor in Hebrew means a bony. And when Yeshua talks about the poor will always be amongst us and the church at Jerusalem, they were giving all of their sustenance. So... That everybody could have equally. Those are the Abonis or the Ebionites. That's what James the Jess was. So the doctrine of the Ebionites goes back to the genesis of the Hebraic people. So they went against polytheism. Gar in Hebrew means to correct, rebuke, or reprove. The church scene, do, 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 I said that. Islam states that the father of Hagar is Selah. The Arabs from her are Hagarites in scripture and Hagarines who conquered. Missouri, Abu Dhabi near Saudi Arabia, Persian Peninsula, and Mesopotamia is Hagar's birthplace. Missouri, Iraq, and ancient Babylon is a possibility as well. Because we know that ancient Iraq, Iraq is Mesopotamia. So Genesis 10 and 26. And Jokatan begot Almodad and Shelef and Hazar, Maveth and Jerah. First Chronicles 27, 30 through 31. Over the camels also was Obil the Ishmaelite. And over the asses was Jadeg the Moran knife and over the flocks was Jezi the Hagarite. All of these were rulers of the substance, which was King David. Psalms 83 and 6. The tabernacles of Edom and Ishmael and Moab and the Hagarines. First Chronicles 5 and 10. And in the days of Saul, they made war with the Hagarines and who fell by their hand, and they dwelt in their tents throughout the east of Gilead. First Chronicles 5 and 10. The Ebu of West Africa identify Eber as their predecessor. Eber means crossover or Passover, referring to those whom passed over the Euphrates River. It was also the name of the Shemites in referring to Abram as the Ebu. Began in Egypt. Eboda or Abed is the region of the Nabateans via Hagar. Abedes in Hebrew means slave. As a maidservant, Hagar was put away. Hagar was sold to that into the house of Pharaoh and entreated as a daughter, allowing her to be given to Sarai. Well, Zamzam, according to the Islamics, is Hagar is where Hagar and Ishmael drank from when she was put away for the second time. Jacob is seen from the same place when Abraham's servant is preparing Rebekah to marry Isaac. The Ebo teach if a man pregnates a woman, he must marry her. If the man is found not taking care of his child, the elders will ask if he slept with the young woman and require marriage. If marriage is not agreed upon, the bride pays is paid and the child can now belong to the man as well. An unmet mother was considered fertile deeming her best for marriage. Shall the child be born in the house of her father? Um, the children will take her father's name in order for the children to get the inheritance of his father. The father must first bring honor to the mother.
Genesis 10 and 29, and Arphasad begat Shelah, and Shelah begat Ephraim. Exodus 21, 7 through 11. And if a man shall sell his daughter to be a maid, maid servant, so it's just looking like Selah possibly sold Hagar during the famine, not sure, or if she went out on her own and became a concubine, a part of um, Pharaoh's house. So Exodus 21, 7 through 11. And if a man shall share, so sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go as the man servant do. If she do not please her master, he hath betrothed her to himself. Then he shall let her be redeemed. To sell her to another nation, he shall have no power, seeing he had dealt with her deceitfully. And if he had betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her with the matter of daughters. And if he take him another wife, her food, raiment, and the duty of her marriage shall not be diminished. And if he do not these three unto her, then she shall go out free without any money. And that's why Abraham didn't have to give Sarah, um, give Hagar no money. So let's read. Midrash states Isaac went into Bear Laharo well to gather Hagar and Ishmael to remarry Abram. According to tradition, Hagar was the description of her social role and Keturah was her name. Keturah means incense in reference to those found in the cemeteries for mentioned. Keturah means a joint not shut in or enclosed. Alluding to the covenant between Abram and her being kept until they later remarried. Zambran, or Zambran son of Keturah, went into Saudi Arabia, the location of Zamzam well. Jokatan originally inhabited the region. Jokshan, brother of Ishmael and Kadar, son of Ishmael, followed. Juxtaposition in scripture shows a correlation between chapters. Genesis 25 and 1, the word again, Yasaf, is rendered in the past tense. So let's read Genesis 25 and 1. Then again, Abram took a wife and her name was Peter. So in the Hebrew that reads, and he took her to be a wife again. I mean, it said it in, in English, but you know what I mean? Um, just as it is shown as a repeated function and action being used the same way in Samuel 19 and 21. It shows a repeated function of a past time event using the same word. Deducing the marriage of Katerah and Abram was already in place. Abram was dying and had to ensure Ishmael would receive his inheritance and for more children. It is also customs for elders to marry when they have children to seek, seeking marriage. Genesis 24 and 62 does show, And Isaac came from the way of the well of Laharwar, for he dwelt in the south country. And this is when he was coming to meet Rachel to be his wife. So if based on custom, this would line up that he went to go get his brother and his brother's mom to bring her to Abraham so that he can get married because he never paid Hagar the bride price. So then he brought her back in, remarried her. This is this is what they stated. And then when I looked into it in the Hebrew, you know, Rabbi Yudin said the Torah teaches that if an unmarried person has an adult's children, he shall see to marrying them all first and then take a wife from himself. From whom do you learn? From Abram. First, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother and then Abram took his wife again and her name was Katera. Let me drink some water. I mean, I do say that he took her again. Then again, Abram took a wife and her name was Katera. Um, and Saul sent messengers to take David. 
And when they saw the company of the prophets, prophesying and Saul standing as and pointed over them, the spirit of God was over on the messengers of Saul. They also prophesied and was told he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time and they prophesied also. So this is repeated function, identical to the word wording used in Genesis um, 25, Yefesh. So, I'm going to read this excerpt from Ancient Traditions of Evil People in Nigeria and wrap the video. And it is titled, When She Has a Child Out of Way a Lot. There's a deity, Aozu Anambram, state called Ningo. If a maiden gets pregnant, her lover denies the responsibility. The priest of Ningo carrying his IU, the sacred oath, would approach the young man with a singular question. Did you sleep with her or didn't you? It's almost impossible to find an old man in any community in Igbo land who is a bastard. The truth is that some of your relatives or even you were born from a lineage of the sons born in the house. Like my children, um, well, my son, I was engaged before I got pregnant with him. My daughter was born in the house, my children. Have my father's last name. That's not my last name. I tell people all the time, like, that's not my last name. That's my daddy's last name. That's my grandfather's last name. My daughter was born in the house. Um, so the truth is that some of your relatives, or even you were born from a lineage of the sons born in the house, who were not claimed by their biological father. The ancient tradition accommodated such children. A children born in a man's compound automatically became his child until the biological father came to claim. The children, if not claimed, lived a normal life. They joined the kindred and lands were given to them. No one addressed them as Naum, Emi, Mikpuk. Some of them did not even know the truth and the tradition of the old forbid the stigmatization of those children. That is why there is no word for bastard in the Igbo language. And also the reason it is impossible to find any old man in any community in Igbo land who was born out of wedlock. They are amongst us and your fathers would never tell you about them until a very serious dispute that requires the tracing of lineages come up. Like when you rediscover the law as in the book of Ezra and you got to know your lineage. Got to know who your father go back to so that they can know what tribe you are a part of. And if they didn't, then you, yeah. In those days, to avert the shame, the family of the girl would do everything to find out who impregnated their daughter. And if the suspect agreed, they would send the girl to him. But if he denied in a place like Azuka, they would invite Ningu Praise for a oath swearing a singular question. Did you sleep with her or not? The priest is not interested in your excuses or the number of other men that knew the girl. All he wanted to know is if you have ever slept with the girl. Once you have ever slept with girl, you must pay her dowry or faith the wrath of Ningu. But there are other parts of the Igbo land where women that give birth out of the way a lot got married faster. The reason was that if a girl gave birth in her father's house, it meant that she was productive. Her father would rest, her husband would rest assured that the girl is fertile. In those parts of Igbo land, such children with a child out of the way a lot attract the most eligible bachelors in the community. It is not an abomination in the Igbo land for a woman to get pregnant outside of wedlock. And there were records of abortionations with herbs. Fornications are not stoned to death, like I read in the Bible. And such women could marry according to her luck. But if the father of the child born outside of wedlock later changed his mind and came for his child, he must perform every customary rites for marrying a woman before taking the child. Note that the rites were performed just to take the child only and not to take the wife also. F take, for instance, if Obi put Ada in a family way and denied after being responsible, the child will become one of Ada's siblings. If Ada got married to another man and Obi, having repented, wanted his child back, he must play Ada's dowry, bring the pots of wine and the tubers of yam before he could claim the child, while Ada would still be her legal husband's house. If not, the child would remain in Ada's father's house, grow up like one of Ada's siblings. So the reason, and this is why a lot of times when young women would get pregnant and they were young, 
the they grandmothers raised their kids. My mama didn't raise my daughter. I've seen it happen. People grow up as siblings and don't know that their mom is their mom and think that it's their sister. Or the young woman gets sent down south and that family down there take her in the baby. Um do 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 So the reason you do not know any of your bastard relatives is because there are no bastards in evil land. A child is a child. We do not reject humans or stigmatize them with the title. Children are seen even in the past as gifts from God. The term Amora Afu Ga Amu Ezi, loosely translated to you don't know the womb that would give birth to a king, is normally used when a maiden gave birth in her father's house. It is more of a constellation or a defense mechanism to acceptance, whatever it came. The evidence of this essay is not to promote promiscuity, but to throw a beam on the tradition of the ancient African community using Igbo as a focal point. Um, we sub-Saharians are somehow connected to our customs and con tradition. That's because Igbos are Gadites. We need to appreciate that our ancestors were conscientious humans that had laws and orders that governmented them. Permit me to share the powers of an evil woman tomorrow who decided, so on and so forth. And so, Namaka is the oldest evil names, meaning a child is beautiful. There are no bastards in evil land. There were sons and daughters of the soil until the foreigners invaded. Let me see if I'm going to find this article. So I have an article. Um, but I'm going to have to find it. So the laws for marriage changed during the time of the Romans. And women who were cohabitating with their children's father, pregnant, um, pregnant, you know, had children, so on and so forth. They were then considered to be whores when Rome came in because they did not have Roman marriage certificates. And so now we have a quote-unquote baby mama epidemic and quote-unquote bastard epidemic when neither of the two existed in ancient Israel. This is Jacoli of Jacolia Gems. Signing off. Bye. This isn't the article, but I'ma add this in. This is mine, Jewish Learning Doc or Betrothal and Wedding. Until the late until late in the Middle Ages, and we're gonna talk about the Middle Ages just very, very briefly. Marriage consisted of two ceremonies amongst the Israelites that were marked by celebrations at two separate times with intervals between Y'all see in West Africa when they had two or three different ceremonies, this is why. And so first came the betrothal and later came the wedding. The betrothal, the woman was legally married, although she still remained in her father's home. She could not belong to another man unless she was divorced from her betrothed. The wedding meant only that the betrothed woman, accompanied by a colorful procession, was brought from her father's house to the house of her groom, and the legal tie with them was consummated. The division of marriage into two separate events originated in very ancient times of marriage was a purchase, both on its outward form and its inward meaning. Women was not recognized as a person, um, but was bought in marriage like chattel. Marriage, um, as with any type of purchase, consisted of two acts. First, the price was paid and an agreement rate reached on the conditions of sale. So when you want to compare child slavery, this is when a man is poor and he sells his daughter as a maid servant. We're talking about he break customs with betrothal, so on and so forth. And it's because the woman, father and mother would receive a, um, a dowry due to the fact that she's no longer there to provide sustenance to the household. So the help that she would provide is re re replaced, as well as because she's her father's possession and the daughters of Zion um, are very pre precious. Even the prostitutes in the Bible had to get paid. 
you go begin to look in Judah and Tamar when he thought he slept with a harlot and he left her his um staff and his signet as a payment and then come back to give her the money that he had owed her. So marriage was as with any type of purchase consisted as two acts. First, the price was paid as an agreement reached on the conditions of sale. Sometimes later, the purchase took possession of the possession. In marriage, the mahor was paid, and a detailed agreement reached between the families and of the groom. And this is sometimes when they have contracts and things written up. This betrothal was followed by the wedding when the bride was brought into the house of the groom who took actual possession of her. In those days, the betrothal was more important of these two events and maintained its importancy as long as marriage was actually based upon the purchase. But as a woman and some more importance as individuals and marriage ceased to be purchased, obtaining moral significance, the actual wedding became more important than the betrothal. And you see that a whole bunch today. Women, we want these big old weddings and everything else, big old rings, but... They're not even with men that they love or becoming wives just to have a wedding, just to have a title. But that betrothal process, that's the legally binding. That's when you become one flesh. Let's talk about it. So, so Jews in the late Middle Ages in European period um, experienced a gradual diaspora shifting from their motherland to the Levant to Europe. Um, and so y'all can read on there. Just read on, on them being, being in there during the Middle Ages. Yeah, this is Jacoli of Jacoli Gems. Our customs for our customs and seals.